Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Annie Tho and Sensing Vitality. And I'm offering these self-help programs. Mostly you see these movement classes, but I occasionally interview some experts in the field of nature, all kinds of things in nature. And today we're going to have a special guest, James Halfpenny, who is an author, scientist, and just an incredible, knowledgeable person about bears, about all kinds of other mammals as well. I'll be talking about that in just a minute, but I want to make sure that you do sign up on this channel. So subscribe and send your comments in and also consider joining Patreon to support these programs and also support at the end, I'll talk about James's programs. He's got some amazing programs. So we're going to get started. Welcome, James. I'm going to talk a little bit about your background. Thank you for being here. And um, James is a, an old time scientist and explorer and has an incredible resume. I can't tell you how impressed I am. He's traveled all the continents on the planet studying ecology, animal tracking, and carnivores. And he's the last 20 years has been studying bears and I met James 10 years ago when he came to the Wilderness Awareness School to teach a course on bears and tracking. And I have one of his many 25 books um, here uh, in my own library and uh, incredible reference of tracking. He's just a master tracker. And so we have so much to talk about, but he's gonna talk about bears today. And I just want to mention too that I was one, he's got this long resume of great accomplishments. He's a Vietnam vet with all kinds of awards for bravery in the field. And so thank you for your service. Thank That's you, Andy. Just incredible. All right. So, anyhow, we're going to get started. James is going to take us off into talking about bears. Why are bears so special? and what we can learn from them, the wisdom of bears, how we might learn about movement, how we might move better from bears. Bears are, I think they're like Tai Chi masters, the way they move, it's just so impressive. So anyway, James, go ahead and take it off. You've got some wonderful slides and uh, images of bears from your studies, so go ahead. Well, Annie, I've been fortunate to be involved with bears. I've traveled much of the world working on bears. Everywhere there's different kinds of bears, be it polar bears, uh, brown bears, grizzly bears, black bears. Uh, since I was 16, I've been chasing bears and really studying them. So that's uh, that's 60 seasons back or so right now. And bears create a very special magic for people. And I'd like to share some of that magic of the bears with you. Bears, they create a quite a magic feeling in us humans. Uh, you know, that fascination goes clear back to the days of uh, in Yellowstone, which is my home, the front porch, uh, people feeding bears on the front porch, the Roosevelt Hotel, car bears, modern days. The number one thing people want to see when they come to Yellowstone is here are the bears. And the bears even have priority in viewing uh, over the wolves. Now, what is this fascination uh, that we have for bears? Well, for one thing, bears like us, they walk upright. They stand on their hind feet. Here's a Kodiak bear. And in order to get a better look while he's fishing out in the ocean for the salmon coming in, he stands. Here's a polar bear, one, two, three steps going after his opponent. Uh, the ability to get up on hind feet is just like us. And very few animals can spend much time up on the hind feet. Bears, the great apes. But for us people, we're up with the bears. The bears are up with us. Female grizzly in Yellowstone up on her hind feet to look over the sagebrush. Now, another thing I think that really fascinates people is that they will nurse their young. The bears nurse their young just like the humans do. And here's a female with yearlings and here come the young and they're pretty good sized bears. And just like a human, uh, they will nurse and take care of their young. They have a great love for their cubs. And another thing that fascinates us is bears are big. This is my lady, Diane. And she's reaching up there about eight foot tall against a cutout of a polar bear to show you how tall one is when it stands up. Not only are they big, they're impressive with their size. Here's a bear coming straight at us on a fishing uh, stream. And another one that will really cause your attention is this one here. You start wondering, how come that bear, he's charging straight towards us. Whoa, what's this mean? Well, this particular bear, not interested so much in 
us, but was charging into a stream to go salmon fishing. Looking over the edge of a vehicle, we watch polar bears from on occasions. Here's a polar bear standing up and up and up. Bears are simply big. And another reason we're fascinated with them is bears are cute and cuddly. Now, here's a couple of little black bears and who couldn't fall in love with these little guys out there wrestling away. And this uh, little cub of the year grizzly has never seen a human before, before. We're the first humans. Notice it keeps wanting to watch, but mom wants away from the humans. Mom, mom, can I look one more time? Come on, mom, mom. What, what are those things? Can't I just check it out one more time, mom? I got to keep going. Okay, I'm coming, mom. No, no, wait a minute, mom. Can't I just have one more look at those humans? And mom says, time to go to safety, but they're definitely cute and cuddly. Now, this particular yearling black bear is coming in, uh, I'm sorry, yearling polar bear is coming into civilization for the first time. It's never seen a swing set. Oh, what 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 is this thing? Oh, hmm. Uh, you um. Oh, you can push it, and it moves. It plays. Uh, this is just a cute little polar bear learning for the first time. Oh, there comes that foot up to push a little bit more. Uh, another thing I think that fascinates us about the bears is bears play. And they like to play with anything they can find. This one's found a little stick to play with. And it plays for with it for a little bit until it, uh, well, uh, kind of losing a little bit of interest there. Uh, this polar bear found a baseball cap that had been discarded. And it's, I think it's, I can almost read its mind and say, now I've seen humans wear these. Now, how do humans wear these? How do you get this thing up on your head? Uh, you know, keep trying like this. Oh, hmm. Uh, whoops, that's not the way. If they don't have a toy to play with, they're just content to, oh, just squiggle around on the snow as this grizzly bear is doing right here uh, for its afternoon rest. Hot day, cold snow, and it'll just squirm around there. And polar bears and other bears will wrestle. This is a pair of polar bears wrestling during the social season. The social season, bears wrestle to learn the size of other bears. And that way, when they're out on the ice and there's a conflict over food, they know, hey, that bear's bigger than me. Maybe I better not get in a fight with it. I'll just let it have food. Bears will play with dogs. I've seen it here in Yellowstone. I've seen it in the Arctic. The uh, polar bear travels across the dark of the Arctic ice. Its only companion is the Arctic fox, a dog. And so when they come ashore, it's not unusual they should play. And you notice the dog's tail is wagging to beat the band. They're having a good time with each other. Play is part of that critical fascination. Another thing, polar bears are powerful. This is my bedroom in a research station up in the Arctic. And you see a polar bear coming to the windows where we have half inch rebar there. Now he's not being vicious. It's just as dark out there in the night. And there's light in there and it's curiosity and he see, wants to see what's going on. But we uh, ran him off. Here's another bear, bear that found a um, snowmobile. And what he's doing, this is a little yearling, decided to uh, just see what it can do to this snowmobile, play with it. He's curious. So he starts tearing it apart. And you can see he's already taken a couple of bites out of the seat. Um, and uh, he's going to take a bite of the foam in a minute. And he tries to spit it out, but it expands his mouth. He's got to, got to open his mouth just a little more and sh shove it out with his tongue. So here, here comes that bite out of there. Right about now, yeah, yeah, uh, uh. had to shove it that little extra to get it out. So polar bears, they're powerful. All bears are powerful. One of the other things about the bears is they compete with us for food. And the fishing streams, they will catch salmon just like we do. But they also take elk and deer for feeding on. They're quite the competitor to us humans. Now, bears 
they have pride and they can be embarrassed just like we do. Here's some bears that are out there wrestling. And this pair of bears on the slick ice and the bigger bear there on the left, kind of backing away, little bear back away. Here comes the big one and whoa. Now that bear crawled off in the sagebrush and he didn't come out until sometime after dark. He was quite embarrassed with that. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of some of the things that are the fascination of the polar bears, not just polar bears, I should say of all bears. And let's get back then uh, to you. Oh, that was marvelous, Jim. Thank you so much. That was fantastic footage. And gosh, I just want to go with you on expedition. That was uh, really inspiring, all these videos you've taken. I've got a few questions for you about movement, about, you know, you've covered so nicely some things unique about bears. You've talked to me before this video a little bit about humans being naked bears. Yeah. The relationship between humans and bears and how intelligent bears are. And some, we talked a little bit about some of the Native American stories, First Nation stories about so many stories about people marrying bears or, you know, the crossover, taking on a bear skin and this kind of thing. But there's a, in Native culture, a real reverence for the bear, for the power and the intelligence of bears. So I'm just curious, having studied bears this long, what inspires you the most about them? What is it that you feel is their special gift in looking at all the mammals that you've worked with? What is it about bears that makes you keep coming back? Bears indeed are special. I think one of the key things about bears for me is the power and the fact that the bear not only is powerful, but when we're out in the bear's home, it's his home. We're not top of the food web. The bear is top of the food web, but the bear is very tolerant of us. They're very intelligent. They're very smart. I think they've got a sense of humor. Uh, if they didn't, we would have a lot more bear people um, encounters of the negative type, but we don't. The bears are around people much of the time. If you leave a bear alone, it's quite uh, willing to exist where you're willing to exist as long as you don't startle it take its food, threaten its food, threaten its young. And those are all things that humans would react to, too. If you try to take my lunch from me, woe be it to you. Yeah. So the bear is very human, but the bear probably sees us, as I've said, as the naked bear. Uh, when people came north, remember, people came north from Africa. There were no bears there in the time of people. And they encountered the bears for the first time. But the converse way to look at that is bears encountered people for a first time. And uh, they developed a tolerance for the naked bear as long as the naked bear played by their rules. Now, of course, the bear decides the rules, not us. And every bear is an individual. You never know which side of the bed it gets up on. So you have to walk with great respect when you're in the home of the bears. Treat them fairly, they'll treat you fairly. All right. You know I would like to know a little bit about bear communication, bear language. I know that they communicate, and in my class, I'm teaching the series on bear lessons and how they move. And communication happens a lot through scent because they have this amazing ability to smell long distances and that they rub their bodies oh. on uh, logs and things so that that's creating communication. But what other kinds of communication do bears use uh, to communicate with? Bears use all five senses to communicate with. You've mentioned smell, but they use bear touch. The touch of a bear is incredibly delicate. A mama caressing her youngster. I've even had the experience of a female caressing my lips with her lips, which is very uh, interesting experience in and of itself. But their sense of touch is incredible and they can be delicate. I've watched a bear pick up food a grizzly bear with three inch long claws pick up food between two claws, just like he was picking it up with a chopstick. And the bears, well, they have both body language. I teach a class, a bear class that is, each night I have the people in with, oh, up to 10 females with cubs. They're, these are black bears, but they are 
wild bears and they come in to feed at this area. We're very close. And you have to learn to read their body language. You have to learn to read the sounds they make. I have a whole repertoire of a class of the different sounds and what it means when a bear makes them. For instance, yes, I've heard that. Chomping like that. The chomping, you also interpret what you hear, what you see with the scene. But that generally means hey, you still have a chance to back up. I'm not happy with this, but you can back out of this. I'm not going to charge you. Each of the bears has a different repertoire of sounds and body movements, which one has to learn. People think, oh, well, we got a polar bear, grizzly bear, black bear. That's all there is to it. No, bears have a very well-developed sense of sociology and how they communicate. Every bear is different. Every group of bears in a geographic area is different from other groups. So how black bears in one area behave can be very different from black bears in another area because they've learned. So all the senses are used to communicate. And if you're astute, you can start picking up these communications, which is just exactly what I teach in my class Mm -hmm. is in there, seeing the bears, being with the bears, listening to the bears, behaving as their body language and sociology tells you to behave. Yeah. Wonderful. Bear movement. I've heard that bear are more related to raccoon than to the dog and they move. Is that true? More like raccoons or what can you say about their movements? No, a bear is not more related to raccoon. They're more closely on the evolutionary chain to dogs. And I would, I would not relate the movements Definitely raccoon movements are very different Hmm. uh, from bears. Bears typically have front feet that point in. Hmm. And that makes them walk pigeon-toed, which when you watch one coming at you, is kind of an interesting movement of that pigeon toe going in. It also probably doesn't mean that they can move as fast as the dog whose toes point out. Now, one of the bears, the giant short-faced bear of the Alaska area, Beringia, during the ice age, it went extinct about the end of the ice age. Its feet, instead of being pointed in, were pointed forward. We figured that was the fastest bear of all. And that bear stood mm. about six foot tall at the shoulders and uh, when it was on all four feet. And it could run fast. Bears also have a big pot belly to get around. Yeah. And so the typical bear movement, when they're moving, they tend to just move a little faster than a normal walk. Uh, What they do is the hind foot oversteps the front foot, and it's just a little bit faster in their normal walk. When they slow down to a normal walk, uh, they're being a little more attentive, a little more curious. And of course, they can slow down slower than that, putting the hind feet behind the front feet. The movement of a bear, uh, one of the studies we did was uh, videos from the side of the bears, and we looked at the length of the legs, length of the body, and how it relates on all the different gates. Um, they're, I guess, constrained by more body weight than any of our other carnivores. Okay, great. Can I ask the question about the thick, thick coat that they have? And it's, it seems so unique, the bear coat compared to cougar or some of the other animals out there perhaps just is it the large size that that they have a thick coat for protection just curious about that super thick coat of hair that they have well hibernation i think we got to think on a year-long cycle for the coat of a bear Uh, when it comes out in the spring the coat will be worn you see a bear coming out of hibernation Uh, there'll be spots where it's really worn down because they've scrunched around on it during the winter and broke their off. And soon they will molt out of that hair and molt into their, over the course of their summer, the fur that's going to keep them warm during the winter time. Mm -hmm. And being a big animal, they can have long hair. You can't put a bear length hair on a mouse. Its feet wouldn't touch the ground. (laughs) Oh, the bear's uh, adaptation to hair is really to the colder seasons and it's got to be kind of uncomfortable in the summer i feel sorry for them then yeah. but where i'm in the back country when we've got streams and lakes we find the bears in the hot part of the afternoon up in the streams and lakes swimming around and that happens in cities too bears come in and get in the 
swimming pools and then it makes the national news we got a bear in our swimming pool a little black bear it's just too much hair yeah um i think the key to the hair though is the hibernation for the hibernating bears and remember not all bears hibernate mm -hmm. for example polar bears don't hibernate but so do bears in areas that are cold but they have adequate food so the kodiak males kodiak male bears on kodiak island which have remnant salmon they may not hibernate all winter so they do also need that long fur in the south the fur is not as long you got a black bear down there its fur is nowhere near as long as that of the black bear fur up here in the mountains of yellowstone all right wow i, I mean i could talk to you for a long time but i do want to mention that you have a lot of programs people can tune into a lot of books a lot of resources but last question i have for you is how can we protect our bears, get along better with bears? What can we do? What can we educate people about? What's the most like important things on your mind for the future of bears and why we need them, <laughs> why we need to protect them? The future of bears troubles me a lot as it does the future of planet Earth and the humans on planet Earth. Uh, go back to Aldo Leopold. Um, down in uh, southwest United States, there was a bear on a mountain called Escadilla. And he was the last bear in the state of Arizona. And the government trapper went in and as the government trapper was supposed to do to protect the cattle, he killed the bear. And Aldo said, well, you know, Escadilla was something special as a mountain. I'm kind of paraphrasing. But with the bear gone, uh, Aldo Leopold said Escadilla is just a mountain. The once wild is gone and bears are wild, it's just a mountain. It's just a state of Colorado. There's no grizzlies left in Colorado. One of the things we've often asked a colleague of mine, Jim Gary and I, is Quo Vadis Ursus. That's Greek for where goest thou bear? Mm. And the bear sits back and the bear answers, I will go where you will let me. Hmm. What that translates to in a bigger picture is we have to preserve bear habitat for bears. But at the bigger picture yet, we have to preserve planet Earth for the bear and the humans. If we can learn to get along with the bear, to preserve it for the bear where we have bears, perhaps we can learn to take care of planet Earth. And I really wonder how well we can do on that in the coming future. It's got to be the goal of all of us to do our little part, then be a joiner, join groups that can do the big part to fight climate change and the population growth, all these sorts of problems. Yes, and preserving the habitat in ways we can, wild habitat, right? There's a lot of things we can do. So oh, thank you so much. I want you to just take a moment and highlight what projects you're doing or what books you've recently published, what programs you're offering so people can know how to get a hold of you. I'll have some links on this video for people to access your materials, but anything you want to highlight, Jim? Well, in reference to bears, each year we do a course called Bears, Bone Signs and Stories. Mm. Jim Gary, my colleague, this oral traditionist, on bear stories, probably the world's leading authority on bear stories. Mm. And we look at the origin and evolution of bears in science and oral tradition from the first bear through to the future. We'll be, we teach that class once a year. We'll be teaching it again the first of June next year. It's a four day class, uh, very up in the morning, out looking for bears at five o'clock till sometimes 10 at night. So for bears, stay tuned. In terms of tracking, I just completed a new book called Track Scene Investigation, like the television show Crime Scene Investigation, but this is Track Scene Investigation, subtitle, Forensic Wildlife Tracking. Mm. And if you'll go to our website, tracknature.com, you can find it and other books on there, or you can also get them off Amazon, but prefer you'd come to our website. Yeah. So those are the two big key things. We're always tracking. We run the Track Education Center here in Gardner, Montana, 
Northgate to Yellowstone. It's the world's largest wildlife forensic tracking organization. And trackscenainvestigation.com will take you to our legal forensic site. You can see a little bit about that. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank everybody for watching. Please uh, like this, subscribe, check out Jim's wonderful resources, and we will see you next time. And let's all think positive thoughts for our bears and planet. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you.